Good evening to one and all, and thank you for joining us in what we hope will be an interesting and interactive session where we discuss the teaching of microbiology transitioning to the new CBME curriculum. My name is Dr. Sudha Ganesan, Managing Consultant, Clinical Publishing, University Press, and it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's subject and the panelists. As you are all aware, the MCI has published the long-awaited CBME guidelines for the MPBS course with a significant shift in the way microbiology should be approached and taught. This has thrown up a lot of questions in all areas, right from decoding the syllabus, devising the lesson plans, to implementing the assessment patterns. This is truly a phase of transition and will pose several challenges to faculty, as indeed any change is bound to do when moving from the familiar to the new. The universities and faculty have had over a year to make sense of the whole process and try and evolve the plan to enable teaching to continue seamlessly the new academic year, where not only is it important to comply with the guidelines, but also take care to effectively impart the core concepts deemed vital to microbiology. So, what to do and how to do it? These are the questions to be answered. To provide clarity and guidance over a parent's confusion, we have with us Dr. Rabha Kanungo, Dean of Research and Professor in HOD at Pondicherry Institute of Medical Sciences, who is a well-known and well-respected member of the microbiology community, is a part of national and international organizations, serving as the current editor-in-chief of the GCRSN, is on the board of journals both in India and abroad, having published numerous articles herself. Joining Dr. Reba on the panel are Dr. Shampa Anupurva, Professor in HOD of Microbiology, Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, and Dr. Suchitra Shanoi, Professor in HOD of Microbiology, Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore. I extend a warm welcome to all panelists. Before I hand over proceedings to Dr. Reba, I would like to invite the attendees to post their questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. The panelists will answer them in the final Q&A session. Ma'am, Dr. Reba, I hand over the floor. It's all yours and please take us through. Hello, a very good afternoon to uh, everybody. It uh, actually gives me a lot of pleasure to be uh, you know, uh, talking to you about microbiology and uh, the transition from the conventional teaching method to the um, competency-based curriculum, which the Medical Council of India has uh, over the years been trying to change. And finally, we've got the uh, prototype and the, uh, the guidelines. Now, um, as we all know, we've been uh, very familiar. We are familiar with one and a half years of teaching microbiology, uh, where we have gone system-wise and uh, uh, taught them uh, based on the organisms and uh, also we have sorry uh, and also we have been very very uh, comfortable with the way that we have uh, been teaching uh, sorry i'm so sorry this seems to be yeah so um so therefore we've been comfortable teaching uh, the system wise uh, based on bacteriology virology mycology parasitology and uh, subsequently we did have uh, uh, the um, applied microbiology but that was not to be because as we know, we are training my uh, undergraduates to become the doctors of a point of first care contact. And they should be having a holistic approach. As microbiologists, apparently it was felt that we were in a silo teaching them only bacteria, uh, uh, microorganisms, where they failed to relate to the clinical situation. So keeping that in mind, the my, um, MCA has, uh, 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 change this to a competency-based undergraduate curriculum. So um, this whole uh, uh, exercise has taken them a couple of years. And in 2018, they came out with the guidelines. 
So what is the need to change the guideline? It was basically felt to equip the Indian medical graduate with the skills and knowledge to function in real life situations. Perhaps the microbiology that we were teaching uh, was uh, uh, not getting them to you know, actually apply it. I still remember a couple of my students whom when I asked them, uh, you know, what do you remember of microbiology? They would always say that, uh, uh, you know, we were shown some colored tubes and we were told that this is E. coli, that is Klebsiella. So, well, that was not what we really wanted, did we? So, therefore, the challenge that has come to us is now to modify the teaching and learning techniques to achieve this goal. So, how do we go about that? We already have a traditional teaching uh, methodology through several textbooks, um, uh, notes, etc. But now we need to change that to a competency-based teaching. And how do we do it? We need to integrate the subjects both horizontally and vertically, by which I mean that uh, <clears throat> instead of teaching them in silos, in compartmentals, we need to integrate both with horizontally with our allied uh, fact, uh, subjects like pathology, pharmacology, uh, and also we need to integrate very effectively vertically like medicine, surgery, uh, pediatrics, uh, etc. So if they have to come out as holistic uh, doctors <clears throat> able to practice infectious diseases, respecting the strengths and necessity of subject-based instruction and assessment. This has to be our um, uh, key, our bottom line, that although we are integrating horizontally and vertically, yet at no point of time should we lose uh, track of the strength that we already have in terms of uh, teaching them microbiology, and which is subject-based. And this, of course, has to be oriented towards the way we instruct them and how do we assess them. So this is a dynamic process which will evolve with requirements as aspirations change. So we know that um, medical curriculum is not static. Every day we are coming across, we come across a different, uh, uh, you know, new findings, new uh, corollaries, new uh, presentations. So therefore this curriculum that we are now embarking upon is similarly going to be a dynamic process and this will have to evolve as time goes on with the requirement and the aspirations of the medical professionals and the need for patient care. So this particular curriculum has been very clearly defined and uh, uh, into several um, competencies. So what do we do? We now have to move from organism-based teaching that we are also very familiar with and we've been doing it for years together now and also the new teachers who have uh, started teaching are also following the same pattern of teaching organism wise but the new curriculum expects that we switch over to case based learning or syndromic approach we align our subject to the real life situation of the medical professional and therefore they have ident it has been identified into different competencies and these competencies are based on knowledge that is, uh, the, the student should have the knowledge, the basic foundation and the knowledge, and they should also know how this uh, process is occurring. So these two things can be uh, uh, talked to them uh, through lectures, through, through a small group uh, discussions, and through um, self-directed learning. These are all methods of adult education. So these are the three key areas how we, where we need to modify our teaching. And how do we assess their competencies? This is based on skills, the skills that they acquire, which they should be able to practice when they move out as clinicians. And to add to the third arm of the competency, we have the attitude, communication, and ethics. Now, this is a new area in microbiology where we have never thought or taught uh, the students regarding what should be the attitude of a laboratorian, what, how should they communicate with the patient if they want to send an investigation or how do they communicate the reports uh, to the uh, patients or how, how do they maintain confidentiality. So these are some of the soft skills that need to be incorporated into our curriculum. And I'm sure all of us will rise to that and see how best 
we can do the ATCOM module for undergraduate teaching. So to uh, the microbiology has been divided. It has got to, uh, eight core topics with the 54 competencies. Now the core subjects, challenges, and the way forward will be described and discussed in detail by Dr. Shampa. And the alignment, which is uh, again an integral part of the new curriculum, and how do we integrate with other uh, uh, departments? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Suchitra will be helping us out in these areas. So now going to the, <clears throat> it has been divided into eight competencies. So the, uh, we, have, we start off with the first competency that is how the student should know to describe different causative agents of infectious diseases. So this is the objective. Now, how do we teach them? How, what are the areas that we need to talk to them about? We can tell them that what are the different causative agents? We talk to them about virus, um, bacteria, prions, parasites, fungi, and, uh, how, and how do we compartmentalize them? Or how do we cohesively present them in the form of their classification, structure, morphology? So we cannot do away with the basic science of microbiology as all of you should realize. Then what are the methods? The next uh, uh, objective is what are the methods to detect these microorganisms which cause infectious diseases? So there we come to the practical aspect where, the, where we teach them, we uh, tell them to develop their skills through sh showing us how to do it. And then uh, through also the other teaching mod uh, uh, module of describing, observing, uh, assisting and uh, performing. So, um, so then that brings us to the two important uh, uh, skills that the MCI has now narrowed down to in terms of gram stain and acid fast, which are two very important and basic techniques, which all medical graduates should know. And, uh, uh, and when we tell them about this, uh, how to uh, detect these microorganisms, we have to go a step ahead and not just uh, stop at teaching them gram stain and acid fast, but how do we, how are they identified in the laboratory in relation to the diseases? So for to know that the students should be able to know how do they grow? What are their nutritions that is required? So therefore in diagnostic microbiology plays a, uh, will come into at this stage of uh, teaching where we tell them in relation to how do we isolate, how do we identify, just in brief, not going into the details of biochemical reactions and um, uh, you know, antigen antibody reactions, et cetera. It is just what are the practices in the laboratory, in the clinical microbiology laboratory, where we, uh, we identify these uh, infectious agents and give the report to the clinicians. The next uh, objective is epidemiology of common infectious diseases. This is the, the entirely knowledge-based. So the student should know how a sporadic uh, disease occurs, what are the outbreaks, what is an endemic, what is epidemic, what is a pandemic. And um, also in addition to that, they need to know what in these situations, what is the role of the microbes in health and disease, especially the normal flora, the microbiome of the body, what are the pathogens, what are the virulence factors that play a role in disease. So this is again, <clears throat> Uh, a competency which we need to teach the students in terms of knowledge and telling them uh, or they should know how these things occur. Then the fourth component is different methods of sterilization and disinfection in the laboratory, in clinical and surgical practice. Now, um, so uh, uh, all along we've been teaching about our autoclave, double jacket, steam jacket, uh, autoclave, or uh, hot air oven, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I still remember there are some very old textbooks which even said sunlight is a sterilizing agent. So <clears throat> we have to go away from that. We have to go away from the uh, media room or the sterilization into what is applied in the hospital. In the hospital, what, do we, what, are, what are the areas where sterilization and disinfection play an important role? It is in the microbiology laboratory, in the central sterile supply department of the hospital, CSSD. And also this brings into, uh, so we have to tell them what are the things which are used, the plasma sterilizers, the ETOs, and their uh, uh, efficacy, what are the things that are sterilized in them, surgical instruments, hospital gowns, etc. So that will bring us to the most important applied aspect of sterilization and disinfection, and that is hospital infection control and biomedical waste disposal. So that can be incorporated into the subject at this point of time, not leaving it to the right at the end where we have uh, uh, you know, these things. So that needs to move forward. Then we come to next important thing in terms of patient care is antibiotics and chemotherapy. This is entirely based on knowledge and the student should know how antibiotics act, how they develop drug resistance, and uh, 
how do we do the look for these antibiotic susceptibilities in the laboratory for uh, patient uh, therapy and for patient uh, treatment. And therefore, that brings us into the, the other important aspect of antimicrobial resistance monitoring. This has been, uh, you know, being uh, uh, blown, uh, I mean, it has gone out of proportion in terms of patient care. So therefore, at this point of time, we should uh, orient the students towards monitoring of antibiotic therapy through antibiotic stewardship. So those topics can move forward into this particular domain. Then we come to three, uh, two other basic uh, 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 topics, and that is immunology and uh, the diseases that are affected uh, uh, by immunological disorders in the human host. So immunological mechanisms in health, this is basically knowledge-based teaching, where we start off with the innate and adaptive immunity, what are the factors that play a role in, in that, and uh, how does the, uh, you know, uh, the host uh, uh, immune mechanism uh, in normal, healthy individual, how does it act? And what happens when there is a uh, disruption in the immunity? So we go on to therefore uh, talk, tell them about mechanisms of immunity and host immune response to infection. And this again is knowledge and uh, the student should know how humoral and cell mediated immunity act and what are their interactions and what are their outcomes in a normal person and also in a diseased person. Now, when we're talking about the types of immunity, we also have, uh, uh, you know, we need to tell them what are natural immunity, acquired immunity, and um, uh, passive immunity, active immunity. So when we're telling them that, we bring in the vaccine into that. So that really, the student relates directly with the applied aspect of, uh, you know, um, an uh, acquired immunity in terms of um, uh, active immunity. So we tell them about the vaccines and the universal immunization program, which is a knowledge. They should be able to know what are the indications, what are the types of vaccines in terms of live attenuated inactive subunit, et cetera. And they should also know about the immunization schedules, not only the universal immunization schedule of the pediatric age group, but adult immunization, et cetera. And what are the recommendations in special instances? Like for example, in this particular COVID pandemic, we're talking about vaccines. So what type of vaccines and how are the pe people going to be uh, you know, protected? So this is something that we need to bring in, move forward the vaccines from different, different chapters into a cohesive uh, presentation in the uh, um, ninth uh, component of the first aspect of um, uh, microbiology. Then comes the integration. And this part of immunology is entirely integrated, which I'm sure Dr. Suchitra is going to throw a light upon. Uh, with uh, pathology, because uh, hypersensitivity, immunological disorders, autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, these are knowledge-based uh, uh, subjects which will have to be uh, taught to the students in, in terms of lectures or uh, uh, small group discussions. And this has to be uh, horizontally integrated or vertically integrated with pediatrics um, and uh, medicine. Now, another aspect that we need to also remember is we have to make it, uh, you know, uh, uh, applied so that the, uh, the, the autoimmune disorders don't remain only as a theoretical branch. So we need to tell them, how do we diagnose these immunological disorders? This is something that we have not been doing earlier and which we need to integrate into uh, the present curriculum where we have to uh, teach the students as to the diagnosis of immunological disorders, what investigations uh, can be done in case of these diseases. Then finally, we have the transplantation and tumor immunity, which um, the um, uh, subject is entirely knowledge-based and um, with, uh, with uh, integration uh, and um, interaction with uh, pathology. So these are some of the very basic uh, first part of the core subjects of microbiology. And this is how we need to uh, integrate, we need to move forward, we need to uh, comprehensively combine uh, the objectives which we had been, uh, you know, differentiating earlier on and make them into a comprehensive group, uh, a comprehensive basic microbiology and immunology, which, we should the, which the students should be um, taught. But remember, one bottom line here is that we should not retain, uh, kind of keep away from the application aspect of it. One of my favorite questions when I ask the students is, how do you sterilize uh, disposable plastic syringes? You will not believe about the answers that I get. You know, you autoclave them, you hot, uh, put it in the hot air, so hot air oven. 
so basically they are not aware that you know plus and some of them even have, say that you know ma'am we get it uh, directly from the shop so why where is the need to sterilize them so this is where we need to change the whole uh, you know attitude of our students and make them see re uh, the reason and uh, look at the patient in terms of studying microbiology even the basic uh, sciences thank you Uh, I, I just thank you, Dr. Rada. Thank you so much. Just before I hand over uh, to the next panelist, I just request um, the attendees to feel free to post their questions in the question answer box which we have below. And as we have a dedicated Q and A session at, for the last half hour of this uh, entire webinar, so please do so right away. Thank you. Uh, I hope I am able to share my slides. Yes, yes, we are able. Oh, yes. Okay. At the outset, let me thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. And uh, this is a very uh, interesting exercise that we have undergone on, at a very short notice. So it was just uh, in a week we have prepared for this webinar and we are here in front of you. So all of us are aware about this new CBME curriculum, which has emphasized on many changes which have been incorporated in this CBME curriculum. So right from the duration of the teaching program to many, many new things. So we are familiar with this uh, as um, Bible of uh, uh, competency-based medical education curriculum, where uh, we, what do we mean by this CBME we are talking about? CBME competency is nothing but the outcome. So outcome-based approach towards diagnosis, uh, I mean, uh, towards uh, uh, implementation of uh, the an as, uh, assessment of medical education program based on a framework of competencies. And competency is a observable ability of a medical graduate, which includes many components of uh, knowledge, skill, and attitudes. So we have all these uh, components here, knowledge, skills, attitude, and uh, we go on, uh, we have made, designed many competencies based on that. So this is, uh, I think uh, everyone knows now that the second MBBS curriculum from a 18 months duration has been compressed to a 11th month duration program. I mean, uh, already the course has been made that a student should know many, many things, but in a very short span of time. And for that, we have to be very uh, careful while designing the timetable so that the, the student utilizes optimally the entire the time available to him and the topics which are overlapping should be taught in an integrated way so that there is no redundancy and no repetition. Otherwise, we won't, will fall short of the uh, curriculum, completion of the curriculum. <clears throat> so these are the levels of proficiency or competency that has been laid down by the uh, Medical Council. We, the bottom line is the knowledge domain, which is the nose, which Dr. Reba has already told. So it is a knowledge attribute. Here only the student will be able to enumerate or enlist or just the basic knowledge in the cognitive domain. Then climbing up, we have the know-how where the medical student should be able to interpret or apply, analyze or discuss. So it is a higher level of knowledge. Then this is a practical aspect of the skill attribute where he will demonstrate what he has learned. And finally, he is able to perform. And then here also, uh, it has been laid down then if the student should be able to perform independently under supervision 
a specified number of times so that you give a certificate you a certified level number of times the uh, student should be able to perform the particular task now we all know that uh, didactic lectures have been uh, reduced to one third of the allotted time that is now we know that there are only 70 lectures in a period 190 lectures is the total time given to microbiology and uh, 70 lectures have been uh, given for teaching giving lectures so the re remaining part of the teaching will be as small group teaching or tutorials or uh, self directed learning and seminars so there is a greater emphasis on acquisition of know how levels in the early phases with a shift to show how levels in the later phases so earlier the, the we will the, we, the, we will try to impart knowledge so that the student learns the mechanisms or the pathogenesis so all this is being taught at the know how level and later on if, if there will be a shift to the show how level and acquisition of both these know how and show how levels will require a shift from the traditional didactic classroom based teaching so it has been repeatedly told that in a classroom teaching uh, the student may not actually grasp the entire topic properly so it is always better where you teach at a higher level that is you want that the student should be able to interpret or analyze or discuss at a show how level i mean know how level so the small group teachings are preferred now but small group teaching so knowledge domain with a lower cognitive level can be taught at the traditional classroom but know how level objectives require small group sessions that allow a greater student involvement with a low student teacher ratio so preferably the about 10 to 15 students with a teacher is very good for a small group discussion or a small group teaching but then there are challenges of this small group teaching there are many competing constraints that restrict the choice of this small group learning sessions firstly faculty comfort is the faculty very comfortable because every week then they'll be involved in small group teaching otherwise uh, we will not be able to complete so like we have uh, suppose we have divided the number of lectures uh, some are we used to just complete our lectures and we were free but now almost every like week we will be having this small group discussions with the students so first is the faculty comfortable comfort second is are the students motivated enough if they don't read and come then these small group discussions they, the interactions will not be fruitful if they just come and sit without having studied or without having gone through what the portions that has to be taught and infrastructure support is a big thing because where will all this small group teaching take place if one lecture theater we have and small group teaching so many uh, we don't have so many chambers i mean big chambers where 10 to 15 students will be accommodated in each chamber of the teacher and uh, i mean a batch of 200 250 students with so many groups where will they sit and where will they teach we have then of course who will teach how many faculty members do we have mostly in a college now medical college they have they have decreased the number of faculty members in the department and at the same time they are emphasizing small group teaching and we do, many colleges don't have this senior residents or even md junior residents to teach in small groups so these are the challenges so it is something like this this is another challenge i feel that uh, in a small group teaching all the teachers may not have a uniform opinion for example this person feels that if the coat is put on the snowman he, it will melt him whereas another person feels that no it will prevent melting whereas the third person feels it will not make a difference so here all of them are having different opinions and you cannot come into a single uh, conclusion so with this background now as dr reba has already mentioned that we have eight core topics and totally we have 54 outcomes or competencies which have been laid down by this cbme curriculum the first topic has been beautifully covered by dr reba general microbiology and immunology following that we have these topics 
cardiovascular system and blood infections, the GI and hepatobiliary infections, musculoskeletal and skin and soft tissue infections, CNS infections, respiratory tract infections, genitourinary infections, and sexually transmitted infections, zoonotic and miscellaneous infections. So I'll be covering one of these infections just to show how we'll go about teaching these topics. So here, this is respiratory tract infection, which has three competencies. There's uh, the 6.1 is the etiopathogenesis, laboratory diagnosis and prevention of infections of upper and lo lower respiratory tract, which will be basically in the knowledge domain and will be taught as lectures or small group discussions. Whereas identification of the etiological agents of upper respiratory tract infections through gram strain will be in the skill domain and will be taught as a DOAP session, which is demonstrate, observe, assist, and perform. And similarly, etiological agents of lower respiratory tract infections, will, which will also have gram stain and acid fast stain. So for upper respiratory tract, maybe gram stain of uh, streptococci, or, uh, for lower respiratory tract, the student should be able to identify definitely mycobacterium tuberculosis, we give acid fast stain and gram stain of some important pathogens like Klebsiella pneumonia or Streptococcus pneumonia. So these skills are imparted through DOAP session. So I would like to show that the number of procedures that require certification are two which have been laid down. That is one is a gram stain, that, that is the acid fast stain. And for each procedure, the number of times I have told that in order to get the certificate is three. So thrice a gram stain and thrice acid fast stain has to have to be done by the student in order to be certified that he can perform them independently. And of course, this is under supervision, but the independent performance actually occurs when the student has become an intern and is able to do it in the side lab. So this was about the practical aspect. Then coming to the theory, this is the competency which has been laid down, describe the etiopathogenesis, laboratory diagnosis, prevention of infections of upper and lower respiratory tracts. Now we should actually derive objectives, uh, break down the competency in the following framework, that is audience, behavior, condition, and degree. Audience is the phase two learner. The student is the audience. And behavior is what he is going to perform at the end of the session. I mean, the objective is actually, uh, the it is a statement that a student can perform at the end of the session. Condition and degree are usually the same thing. Condition is, uh, we lay down a condition that the student can perform independently or in a small group or whatever condition is given. And the degree is actually whether the student who can do it completely or correctly. So keeping the fact that condition and degree are same throughout all the objectives, we can design the objectives as such. So this is the table that is uh, should be, in, I mean, we use this table to prepare the objectives. This is the six uh, competency 6.1. Audience, as I have told, is the phase two student. And what do we expect the student to have learned from that competency. So first, he should be able to define upper respiratory tract infection and lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, what do we mean by upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract? What are the infections of upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract? Like rhinitis, pharyngitis, adenitis, they might go in upper respiratory tract, whereas bronchitis, bronchopneumonia will go in definitely in lower respiratory tract. Then enlist the causative agents of these infections. So these all can go in a lecture. This is the no domain, K domain. Then coming to pathogenesis. The upper respiratory tract infections are caused by definitely bacterial causes or streptococcal sore throat, diphtheria. So they can be covered by lectures and viral upper respiratory tract infections. These are the causative agents, adenovirus, rhinovirus, Epstein-Barr virus. So we could take a small group teaching for these viruses together. Coming again to the lower respiratory tract infection, bacterial causes, we have streptococcus pneumonia, H influenzae, Klebsiella pneumonia. They can be all covered together in one lecture. And then we 
tuberculosis is a very big chapter. Then we have the NTMs and the hoping cough. I've uh, kept it as a self-directed learning because uh, few uh, self-directed learning have, has been included in this curriculum to actually encourage the student to learn by himself because one of the roles that a medical graduate should have is a lifelong learner. So we are inculcating this habit of lifelong learning right from beginning by giving them some topics of self-directed learning so that he prepares, of course, under guidance. And we see that whether he has learned what is expected to learn. Then other causes are atypical pneumonia, like uh, legionella pneumophila, chlamyd uh, chlamydia pneumophila, and uh, we have uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. So this can be also covered by a small group teaching. Viral causes, we have influenza, uh, para-influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, coronavirus. These are again covered by lectures. Fungal causes, aspergillosis, pneumocystis pneumonia, systemic mycosis, and parasitic paragonemiasis. They can be again covered in a lecture. For laboratory diagnosis of these infections, I would uh, again uh, suggest small group discussion for uh, upper respiratory tract can be one and lower respiratory tract can be one or maybe two. And then we discuss the vaccines because the competency was etiopathogenesis, laboratory diagnosis and prevention. So the vaccines against cornibactum diphtheri, streptococcus pneumonia, bordetella pertussis, hemophilus influenzae, mycobacterium tuberculosis, influenza, they can be together or while teaching the individual organism, we could talk about the vaccines individually also. Now coming to challenges of teaching. Can we teach all the organisms by strictly assigning them to a system? Is it possible? Because now so much of emphasis that we were all teaching microbiology organism wise, we should immediately shift to system wise. What is the problem in teaching it? We find that the same organism is infecting multiple systems. So how do we teach them? Do we teach each organism completely in one system and then just mention it while teaching the other system or teach the organism multiple times? So I have just uh, listed a few examples, but there are many more. For example, if we teach Staphylococcus, we can teach it under uh, main, of course, it is a pyogenic organism. So it should be there in skin and soft tissue infections. But at the same time, it can cause food poisoning. And so staphylococcal food poisoning goes to the GI tract. Similarly, we have diariogenic E. coli under the GI tract, whereas uropathogenic E. coli in the genitourinary system and pulmonary TB in the respiratory system, whereas tubercular meningitis goes into the CNS. Leptospira will be present in blood as well as it can cause aseptic meningitis, so it should be in the CNS. So this way, it goes on. Again, we can, it, the earlier slide showed the same organism infecting different systems, whereas we can have different genera or different species of the same gen genus infecting different systems. So we cannot, can we teach NTMs together? No, because now mycobacterium avium intracellular goes in respiratory tract, whereas mycobacterium ulcerans and marinum goes in skin and soft tissue. Or for that matter, halophilic vibrios, vibrio parahemolyticus comes in the GI tract, whereas vibrio vulnificus and alginolyticus come to skin and soft tissue. Flukes, we have the liver and uh, liver flukes, the lung flukes or the urinary cystosomiasis. Then this slide again shows that the same organisms can be assigned different systems in different institutes. Like non-fermenting gram-negative bacilli, pseudomonas, acinetobacter can be kept on the hospital acquired infections or in respiratory tract infections. This is just an example. It could be kept anywhere else also. Or enteroviruses, we felt they are actually in the CNS, but they are entero, so they can, could be in the GI system. Zygomycosis. We thought it should be in skin and soft tissue. Some people told no, it is in the upper respiratory tract. Or systemic mycosis, I, we thought it is in the lower respiratory tract, but it could be also in the blood because it is a systemic infection. So this way, again, it is confused. It can create confusion because students from one institute will think that these organisms can infect only this system, whereas from another institute, and more so the examiner who thinks that the organisms 
in their college are mentioned in a particular system could ask questions but then uh, the we are teaching the organisms in a different system so this way these all can create confusion and i would finally say that teachers think that they have taught but we do not, we are not sure whether the student has actually understood the content by making so much of division of the same organism in different systems thank you i invite dr suchitra now to proceed with her presentation good evening i hope you are able to see my slides yes ma'am yes good evening uh, everybody it's uh, about integration and uh, alignment and uh, i would just like to thank the organizers for this opportunity and according to the gmer 19 second professional teaching hours this is the table which we are all very familiar and we also have seen that microbiology has got 70 lectures 110 small group teaching and uh, practical hours 10 self directed learning totally around 190 hours previously we had this privilege of having 100 lectures and sct and practicals of 150 hours and total 250 hours so we are short of 60 hours i would say now how do we go about and try to complete our entire portion and teach our students in this 60 hours now gmr 19 in chapter 5 they have given us about microbiology competencies to be completed and also towards the end they are talking about teaching should be aligned integrated horizontally and vertically and many most importantly they have said in organ systems with emphasis on host microbe environment interactions we have always been used to teaching students as organism based we have never gone by, uh, by the organ system which is very easy for pathology because they have always been teaching as an organ system so it is a very easy migration for pathology people whereas for us it is going to be slightly difficult as already uh, madam has said that same organism causing infection in multiple organs where do we teach them how do we teach them how do we assess them this is a big confusion i am sure all of us are going through but as batches come we will all be settling down but just an idea about integration or how we can try to bring about or reduce the number of classes now in the same document the competency table is showing us regarding the competencies domain suggested teaching learning method assessment method and also it is showing what are the possible departments with whom we can do a vertical integration or a horizontal integration when we are talking about the integration if you go through a, through the volume 1 in microbiology towards the end they give us the different topics in the different uh, departments with whom we can integrate there are total 151 topics which have been suggested for integration if starting from biochemistry which is having one single competency which we can integrate now all of us are going through our uh, medical education unit uh, you know uh, going through all these uh, training programs i'm sure that you have been seeing this diagram about alignment and integration and at the end of the session we forget what this means so we only know about temporal coordination sharing correlation nesting i am totally confused at the end of it what is this happening what is sharing what is correlation what is nesting so this is also present in one more document which is medical council of india alignment and integration module for undergraduate medical education program which is released in 2019 page 1 to 34 now talking about alignment there are two types as we already know it could be horizontal or it could be vertical when i am talking about the horizontal alignment it's in the same phase between microbiology pathology and pharmacology now 
forensic has taken a back seat because it's going to become phase three, part one. Now we already have aligned the organ systems. So all systems will be taken at the same period. So that's one first step towards alignment. Second step about alignment would be if you can take the topics similarly in the same phase, or I'm sorry, in the same block as we can say. For example, in our system, we are trying to take the neoplastic disorders will be taken by pathology towards the end of the first 12 weeks. Or, and so we are thinking of finishing the oncogenic viruses at that particular time. So that would be the horizontal integration of one topic. Similarly, when we are talking about immunology, what we think about is the first part of immunology can be taken up by microbiology. When we are coming towards the end of transplantation and uh, tumor immunity, etc., it will be elaborately discussed by pathology. But the students should know that this is a topic which can be uh, asked or can be an uh, assessment question in microbiology. So what we would suggest is put it as a self-directed learning topic and take it as a formative assessment part in case of a small group teaching. So that would be, uh, you will be reducing the number of classes to be taken virtually, you know, with the students present in the class. Similarly, in case of vertical alignment, we have already tried tuberculosis from last seven years. We have been doing this in our uh, college. We dedicate an entire week. We used to do that previously, but now I think it is going to be much easier for us to do this alignment because we don't have to change the timetable entirely. Previously, in last seven years, we used to do one complete week was dedicated for tuberculosis. Each hour, that particular department would come and take the particular part of tuberculosis. There would be no repetition of any part. We would start like community medicine would start about with epidemiology of tuberculosis, starting with one case. And then the pulmonary medicine would take it up in the next hour, talking about the clinical features and the presentation of the particular patient. Third hour, microbiology would be taking about the organism, detail, and pathogenesis. Now that day would end. So the next day would be pathology, which would start off in the next day with the uh, different gross and presentation of uh, tuberculosis. Then again, microbiology would come, um, the uh, com uh, uh, pulmonary medicine would come and talk about the clinical features and the imaging techniques which would be required and what were the different kind of specimens to be sent. Microbiology would take the laboratory diagnosis. Pharmacology would teach the drugs. Then again, pulmonary medicine management of the patient and community medicine would end it with the national programs. So this is how vertical integration was done. We have already tried it and we have been doing it for last seven years. And along with this, in the same week during the practicals, we teach the students about acid fast strain, uh, uh, staining. And there would be certain small group uh, teaching classes during that week. In those hours, we would introduce them to atypical mycobacteria and also mycobacterium leprae. Mycobacterium leprae was given as a student seminar. So this is the way we would like to align and make involve the students in the teaching program. Now we would like to do the same thing with HIV with involving the community medicine, microbiology, pathology, pharmacology, and medicine department. So this was an example of the vertical alignment, which is tried by us for one topic. So we believe we can do it for another topic too. So what happened was when we did this, tuberculosis, instead of taking three classes, we were able to do it in two hours. So that reduces one hour for us when we were taking this particular chapter. When we go on to the other methods of integration, sharing, lower respiratory tract infection. This is also we have tried for last five years in our institution. Now, there are three different competencies. One is in microbiology, one in uh, pathology, and one in medicine, which are all directed towards pneumonia. So in case if we are going by the conventional method, we would be taking their own two classes to talk to them about the community acquired. I'm talking only about the community acquired pneumonia. I'm not going to the rest of them. We're talking about community acquired pneumonia for two hours. Maybe pathology talks about the gross and everything for two more class because they have to talk about the initial parts, clinical features, and then the gross. Medicine department starts all the way from etiology ending up with management. 
Now, if you are going to do sharing, now in this particular situation, what, what was done in the institution was we had a continuous running PowerPoint, which from the beginning of the patient presenting till the management end, we all of them individual departments contributed whatever was our objective to that particular PowerPoint. The, the first starting class would be by medicine or PTCD pulmonary medicine, who started off with the case history, how the present, patient presented. And then the microbiologist who is present in the same class continued to talk about the etiological agents and what is the way of laboratory diagnosis and the pathogenesis. Pathology came in between to talk about the gross. And at the end of the third or fourth hour in the same session, we ended up teaching about pneumonia. So this is, was the sharing. So we had put all our objectives together, learning objectives together, the different departments, we found that some of them were common between two or three different departments. Those were made as single. So we decided who is going to take that particular objective. That decision is taken upon about the core of each subject. For example, the pathogenesis and laboratory diagnosis becomes very important for us as microbiologists to teach the students what is the specimen required. When do you collect the specimen? What how do you give a report or how, they will, how does the final part of your report looks like? So these were the parts which is a core for us in pneumonia. What is the etiological agents? What are the virulence factors? So that is that part in the sharing will be taken by microbiology. Whereas medicine people, their core would be to see how the patient presents symptoms and how they will manage. So that is a core which they will have to take. So it is very easy for us when we are doing the assessment to say that I have taken this part and this is what I am going to assess the student for. Similarly, in case of correlation. Now here, I've just given you an example of antibiotic uh, resistance pattern. In case of microbiology, we have some drug resistance and monitoring of antimicrobial therapy. Whereas pharmacology has a competency regarding the antibiotic stewardship program. And when we go to medicine, we see they have got empiric and appropriate treatment and three competencies which are dedicated, two competencies which are dedicated for this particular topic. Now here, if we are going by the horizontal integration, we are trying this. We will be talking to the students regarding the antimicrobial resistance, different methods available for testing and also how to monitor it. And my, meanwhile, the chemotherapy part is going to get over in case of pharmacology. And in one of the SGTs, common SGTs, we are going to discuss the rational use of antimicrobials, including the antibiotic stewardship program. Now, all this in the SGT, when we are discussing, we are going to do this with a particular case, which will be discussed with the students. Now, the higher level of competency will be discussed regarding this case in medicine. So that is correlation. So coming to the nesting, now I've taken the example of the particular uh, uh, topic which we are sharing with biochemistry. First topic is about their topic or competencies describe the antigens and concepts involved in vaccine development. Lot of immunology is taken by biochemistry today, but they are when we speak to them, they say they've just given a summary of everything. They've not gone into it much deeper. But we are having discussed the immunological basis of vaccine and described the universal immunization schedule. And then pediatrics has everything about immunization, about vaccines, et cetera, in their three competencies. So there need not be an integration as such. It would be just called as nesting that when I am taking a topic on this immunological basis of vaccine and universal immunization schedule, I would keep a lecture and in the beginning of the lecture, I would like to give them an introduction to what they have already studied in the first phase regarding the antigen and the vaccine development. Similarly, when it goes to pediatrics, we would try to tell them that this is what has been covered by biochemistry and microbiology and they have been assessed for this particular part. And therefore, you can continue regarding this further. So this is what we would be talking about the nesting. Now, if you go on towards the uh, GMER or the integration and alignment uh, modules, which are being given to us by, for, uh, by the uh, MCI, and now known as NNC, they have said that you need to integrate less than or equal to 20% of the topics only. 
they're not asking that the entire topics or the entire subject has to be integrated it is only around 20 percent they are asking us to integrate and they've also given us the examples and the different departments with whom we can integrate yes it is going to be difficult we are students and teachers of Esther years who are teaching the students of the coming years and we are changing the method of teaching completely so we have to learn how to do it maybe we learn from each other and therefore the core subjects of the sub of the objectives of the subject should be given importance whenever we align or whenever we are going to do any kind of integration this should not be forgotten when we talk about the learning objectives or the lesson plan of that particular topic or the organ system now they also mentioned that it is a integration of the concept not the teacher so that means multiple teachers need not be present in one given class except that when when you are trying to do the sharing rest of the places i can always take about a little bit of topic from the medicine we are all medical teachers we are all medical graduates we understand the basics which can be taught to an mbbs student so i think we have upgraded ourselves to a greater extent with the basic knowledge of mbbs so definitely we can touch upon it we just have to talk to the other department and ask them what is the learning objective which they would teach in that particular topic and we may have to integrate it and just tell them the further thing about this will be taught to you in the next department or in the next phase so that is concept integration and it's not a teacher integration so multiple teachers need not be present in a given class i would fail if i don't acknowledge my department colleagues from manipal and mangalore who have all who have come together to make this particular uh, teaching schedule for the coming batch i also am grateful to the departments of pathology and pharmacology for trying to adjust with us and helping us to understand this organ system the medical education unit who has thought us about the different terms and definitely our university who is giving us the entire support thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Suchitra. Uh, Dr. Shampa, could you take it forward? We are now tackling the assessment patterns. Give me a minute. I'm just sharing my slide. Certainly. So now we come to the assessment part, like uh, we have taught the student and this is the summative assessment we are talking about because formative assessment is done throughout the session. But again, when we are assessing, we have to assess the knowledge, the knows and knows how this is the Miller's pyramid, which I have earlier referred. And uh, this uh, knowledge is always assessed by a theory paper as well as viva oc whereas the practical skills are assessed by your practical examination ma'am are you sharing your screen yes <laughs> okay sorry sorry i go Sunny. Sorry, wait, wait a minute. I'm not able to do it. Would you like us to share your screen? Yes, yes, please. I have somehow missed. Mr. Universe uh, or Prashant, could you please share uh, Dr. Shampa's second uh, presentation? Do try. It's uh, the share screen, the green button. Madam, can you tell me what is the file name? Uh, it is okay, Dr. Transition to. Tran
ସେମାନେ ବି କରୁଛନ୍ତି ମୁଁ ବି କରୁଛି yes ma'am i think uh, your ppt is on yes i'm i'm comfortable please go, ahead. Please go ahead. yeah okay yeah so now we come to assessment of the second uh, professional student at the end of the uh, session of the end of uh, 11 months when we go to summative assessment we have to assess his knowledge the cognitive domain by means of theory exam as well as viva voci and the practical skills are always assessed by the practical examination now we think that by teaching the student different systems where there is overlap of organisms between the systems even if we demarcate the theory paper into paper 1 and paper 2 and we have the same organisms in most of the uh, systems the students will feel this way they are absolutely confused as to what to, what will be the course content for paper 1 and the course content for paper 2 this is from the students point of view and in many places like ours we have to have one internal and one external and so the question paper is not shared the internal does not know what the external has asked both the papers are not set by the same paper setter so there is every possibility that the same in organism has been asked in both the papers so to avoid this we thought that even if we teach the organisms in under different infections while assessing we should be assessing paper 1 should include general microbiology and immunology in section a and section b will have systematic bacteriology healthcare associated infection bio waste management bacteriology of water food and air so it is very clearly demarcated paper 1 itself can have two examiners now uh, who can set paper questions for both the sections and similarly for paper 2 section a could have questions related to virology and section b questions related to parasitology and mycology but are we moving away from what mci has laid down it will definitely not be like that because we also have a component of viva voci where the student has come prepared with everything when he is facing the viva we can ask a uh, overall question from any system so there if he is facing two vivas and then the examiner could be the systems can be divided between the two examiners and he sits for viva in two places and he answers questions related to each system where he will be answering bacteriology virology parasitology all together and we also have some, enough time we will be having vivas during the uh, teaching when it is not that we are Uh, again compartmentalizing into organisms bacteriology mycology virology is not that but it is only to make it easier for the student to know what he has to read for his uh, paper and also for the examiner to know what he has to set questions so for that we have uh, thought that uh, instead of dividing it into system wise two papers let it make it, let it make it uh, simple by making it uh, section a paper 1 section b bacteriology and paper 2 section a virology section b parasitology and mycology so this is a sort of a schematic uh, 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 theme of what we have made for our uh, question paper there will be a long answer question which will be either a structured or a modified essay type question so it will be a case based and uh, it will be 15 marks short notes will have 5 Six marks each, thirty marks, and although MCI has told that we cannot go beyond twenty percent objective questions, so we thought twenty percent in a uh, hundred marks paper, we felt it is a bit too much. So we thought if it is we, the maximum limit is twenty percent, we can keep it ten percent. So five marks in each section. So ten marks will be objective questions, which could be everything, fill in the blanks, MCQs, true or false. match the following or give an example of uh, whatever we can uh, ask five marks and then uh, 30 marks will be short notes and long answer question will be 
15 marks, which makes it 50 marks for one section. And the same replica can be done for section B as well as paper two, both the sections. So that way, uh, it, it, the, it becomes 100 marks and all types of questions have been asked. Plus we have Viva again, 20 marks where we can assess the student. So we can all be on the same page, even though we may ha all have a different story. Like there is so much of argument, so much of discussion, so much of confusion. So we thought that uh, we are all learners. In this, CBME has laid down a curriculum and CBME has also laid down the levels like novice and then advanced beginner, competent, proficient and expert. So now we are just novice. Maybe four or five years later, we'll become competent enough in teaching the CBME curriculum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shampa, Dr. Suchitra. You take this forward. Yeah, uh, talking about the assessment, uh, we can, uh, as Madam has already spoken about the org organism-based assessment, we can also do it as a system-based assessment, but we have to do one important thing here is when we are doing our SLOs, if we are going to have in the first uh, paper, we are going to have regarding general microbiology, immunology, respiratory tract, and possibly blood and uh, cardiovascular system, and maybe the other system comes in paper two. So we can always have that, uh, we can have uh, two long questions, maybe case-based and maybe another few uh, short note questions and maybe, uh, and also MCQ questions, maybe 20. But when we are going to go by system-based, how do the students learn? What do they want to do? Because as we already know, there is a single organism which can be taken up in different systems. So when that is the case, we have to do in our learning objectives, like a major organism and a minor organism as we are planning to do here. That is in case I'm going to teach that uh, streptococcus pneumonia is going to be a major organism, whether it is in paper one or paper two, because in paper one, it would be coming probably in the respiratory tract infection. Whereas in the paper two, it is an important organism in central nervous system. So we have to decide which are the major organisms and minor organisms in the two different papers. When it's a major, it comes in that particular paper if it is a major in the second part, it will come in the paper two. So when I'm talking about the integration, now in the UG curriculum book, volume one, in page 34, they've already shown us about the anemia. There is one competency, MI 2.4, where they are talking about the micro microbial agents which are causing anemia. They've also given us the integration pattern that is horizontally we can integrate with pathology when they're talking about blood and their hematology part. And they talk about integrating with general medicine. Now, I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah. I am. No, it's not visible. Can you share? One minute. Can you see the sharing now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, sorry. You're on. Okay, so this is about the assessment part. So when I talk about, um, when I go on to the UG curriculum volume one, that is the page 34, they're already talking about the anemia part and they're talking about horizontal integration with pathology and vertical integration with general medicine. So when they're talking about this, they're telling us what can be, what could be the possible learning objectives. They're talking about enumerating the different microbial agents, the morphology of the agent. Now morphology of the agent, we have to be very careful here that we don't go into depth of this particular thing here because we are going as a system based. We need not teach them everything. We have to teach them only those parts which is important for them as an infective stage or a diagnostic stage. And then mode of infection, which is very, very important when it comes to prevention of the disease. So we have to understand that how much is going to be taught to the student? What is going to be taught to the student? That will be based on what we are going to assess the students on. So when we're taking this as an example and moving forward, they have to remember that assessment is subject-based. It's not only the topic-based, it is subject-based. 
as i mentioned in my previous talk also that i would be interested to talk only about the virulence factors laboratory diagnosis possibly and the prevention if i am talking about an organism i would not be very much interested to force on the undergraduate regarding the how do you identify it what is the biochemical reaction that i would not be giving much of an importance at this present with just left with 190 hours and in those 190 hours possibly we will lose a lot for the formative and summative assessment also so when we talk about the long question we would be giving it as a case based question now taking anemia itself as an example i would talk about give a case history of a child coming with pica and possibly the stool is having some eggs and ova all these these would or i would give a blood picture and say he is having microcytic hypochromic anemia and possibly ask the student to give a differential diagnosis and that would be hookworm infestation similarly for kala azam and for malaria maybe i will give a peripheral smear picture as an indication and take this case forward and ask for an assessment short note questions in this particular part would be pathogenesis due to an organism or laboratory diagnosis of a specific organism or an or, or a clinical presentation febrile illness or an anemia part and prevention of the disease condition maybe i would be talking about the anemia how to prevent anemia because most of them if it's an infective cause it's more of hygiene maintenance because whether it is megaloblastic or microcytic anemia there is there is a lot of scope to give a multiple choice question but at what level we will be giving the multiple choice question would be at a re recall level or it would be at an analysis level that is something which we have to discuss and decide and try to encourage the students to give to have the assessment at a higher order again going to the demonstration and practical session here we would like to teach them about the microscopic and macroscopic identification that is in case of malaria possibly a gamete in case of macroscopic we would make, to make it very interesting for the student we may have to show them an ascaris or maybe a hookworm these forms can be shown to the student but it would be ideal to have an applied exercise where we are discussing something about the cases about this patient presentation of this anemia case why we will see something similar in case of theory so with this i again thank all the people who have been uh, you know being a constant support to each one of us and that's the end of it. thank you thank you so much uh, dr shampa i invite dr reba now literally to take us home on this one there is uh, there are so many questions as you would have seen the q and a box how do we do it dr reba how do how does faculty tackle the next coming year Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Please go ahead. All right. So, um, can you Please see my slides? Screen. Yeah. Can you see them now? Not, not right? yet. Not yet. Okay. Um. Would you like us to? Uh, no, no, no. I've got it. You can got you see it. now? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. No. Not yet. Oh. No. Yes. Yes. Please. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. All yes. right. So yeah, finally we come uh, to the actual uh, basic discussion on uh, competency-based uh, curriculum. And at this point of time, I'm sure we have a lot of traditional books which are available to uh, to us. And uh, so, how do we make use of what is available? Uh, in terms of uh, modifying or transitioning to the competency base, because we need to have uh, some material based on which we go forward. So the resources for transitioning from conventional to competency-based microbiology, um, we from the Orient, uh, uh, we have actually um, uh, the University Press have brought out the eleventh edition of uh, Anant Narayan and Panikkar's textbook of uh, microbiology. This is basically a, not a complete o, um, overhauling for the CBME, but yes, what we have, uh, what has been uh, incorporated, are directions on how to use this book for the CBME. So this retains the conventional topics, 
but incorporates the prescribed competencies as and when applicable. Applicable. The book actually begins with a small note to the teachers, uh, saying that you know how to how best to make use of this and adapting this book to the CBME. Uh, so here, if, if you see, we have there is this uh, um, system-wide CVS and bloodstream infections, and where the organisms which can come into that have been highlighted. Now, now uh, if you see the last sentence which we have mentioned, we have taken uh, time to work on the uh, template provided here as an example of organized uh, organisms to be taught in each system. However, the teaching organisms that require detailed explanation is best left to the teachers or the instructions um, uh, to the teachers. So discretion. So therefore, this is sorry. Uh, this is just um, uh, just an adaptation. So we have uh, highlighted the organ uh, the systems and what are the organisms that you can um, you know concentrate on. So um, and it will tell you how to uh, use this book. Uh, uh, so what is going to happen is that you may have to go back and forth, back and forth because of the overlap. Like Dr. Shampa and Dr. Suchitra have already mentioned that there is going to be an overlap where you teach the organism uh, in the, the major, uh, its contribution uh, as a major pathogen to a particular system, but it does happen in other systems also. So you will have to go back and forth and try to guide the student as to read the chapter, but apply it to various systems. So um, uh, for example, when we look at the basic uh, uh, the immunology part of it, where I was mentioning that, you know, we need to teach them uh, the diagnosis of autoimmune disorder. So if you see, we have uh, in general microbiology, we have uh, uh, highlighted what are the various uh, knowledge and know-how um, based um, information as well as uh, uh, skill based information that they need to show. So this has been outlined there. So this uh, page, this chapter you will find as per the CBME in the 11th edition of the Anantanarayan. And then coming to the other aspect, which I where you see here, it says that outline the methods uh, for uh, detection of immunological disorders. There is an, a, a, a part, uh, this is only meant for undergraduates, remember, we are not telling you, they are not going to become um, you know, immunologists. So uh, the portion that is required for them at the undergraduate level has been given very briefly in this um, particular chapter. Then coming to the other aspect where we need to teach them some skills and uh, uh, in the form of show how or uh, uh, observe, uh, assist and uh, perform. So in the diagnostic microbiology section, there is one chapter on diagnostic microbiology where uh, uh, various techniques have been uh, um, uh, you know, highlighted. So you can pick and choose from here and uh, highlight it for the undergraduates and give it to them to uh, read it as a self-directed learning and come back to you and explain to them uh, regarding uh, uh, you know, the infections. And in this diagnostic microbiology, also we have in included uh, the emerging infections like H1N1, SARS, MERS, cov etc. Uh, as uh, you know, in the diagnostic uh, part. Then uh, next we come, this is actually the chapter which I would, uh, I mean, if, uh, if you're getting this book, uh, which I would uh, request all of you to use this as a dashboard. This is the uh, chapter which actually includes uh, the systemic infections and their laboratory diagnosis. And the systems that have been covered in this are basically the competencies which have been outlined in the CBME curriculum, which includes this, uh, the CVS and um, bloodstream infection, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, etc. So the whole book, uh, this whole chapter includes all the uh, systems, um, uh, ba system based uh, objectives uh, which have to be dealt with in the CBME curriculum. Then in this chapter itself, we have also included a diagnostic algorithm. So this, is, this will help the student as to know how, supposing he says, okay, how will you diagnose a case of bloodstream infection? So what are the steps that he needs to understand in terms of um, procedures that have to be uh, done to diagnose a case of uh, bloodstream infection? So this has been laid down uh, in, this, in the chapter. And every system that we have discussed, like the musculoskeleton, or a CNS infection, every chapter has a flow diagram or a flow chart or an algo diagnostic algorithm, which will be helpful for the students. Then uh, we also have included uh, laboratory diagnosis uh, so that this is again 
the student should know how a fungal infection a fungal infection is uh, diagnosed in the laboratory what are the uh, steps this is just again self could be self directed learning or small group discussion where uh, you know you ask them to uh, to read up on this and then you can discuss the application of these uh, diagnostic uh, technologies for various uh, fungal infections so like that we have for bacterial infections and um, uh, and for viral now the other resource materials which are found in this uh, book are case scenarios to initiate competencies now i found a couple of um, participants asking for uh, uh, you know the cases where can we get these cases so if you look at the 11th edition you will be able to get in almost all chapters uh, uh, organism based chapters actually have case scenarios so you could build up on that use that as a platform uh, or as a uh, stepping stone and build up your cases uh, for um, uh, the competencies and also at the end of the chapter we have uh, put in a few questions for each chapter as formative as formative assessment questions however what we do not have in this particular edition of ananta narayan is the parasitology parasitology has not been included here you will need to consult a parasitology textbook and i'm sure there are plenty of them out there uh, which uh, will help you but one thing you have to keep in mind that a parasitology book actually goes very much into the depths of uh, you know the the parasitic infections in terms of their life cycle the transmission the vectors and the uh, you know on the first stage second stage etc etc so there you'll have to actually pick and choose the ones which are going to be applicable to the competencies which have been laid down uh, in the curriculum and uh, uh, teach them uh, very briefly on uh, you know because transmission is important because that's something that they will need to know uh, in terms of uh, uh, prevention so uh, uh, basically uh, uh, briefly about the life cycle and the transmission but uh, um, concentrate more on the disease process as well as the diagnosis the diagnosis is what as microbiologists they need to know what is the system what are the specimens which have to be uh, you know used for diagnosing these uh, parasitic infections so that is how we have to uh, make uh, use of the parasite existing parasitology books to uh, to teach uh, competency based uh, um, subjects uh, in microbiology thank you i hope this is going to help be of use to you and helpful in uh, in transitioning from our traditional teaching method to what we now visualize as uh, competency based and like as dr shampa and uh, dr suchitra have already mentioned we are all learners we are no experts because we we are also learning and we, since we have not even had a practice of taking these classes of course like as dr suchitra said we also have been teaching uh, we also have been taking integrated classes uh, tuberculosis leprosy hiv typhoid i mean enteric fever so those classes have been uh, going on for past couple of years for undergraduates and we've learned a lot through that but however with this uh, particular curriculum where we need to really have a real look um, and like as dr suchitra said it's not that every class has to be integrated it's only just 20% so those 20% we have to form a group or a, a core core group and then decide on who, how we go about it it has to be a unified uh, uh, you know com combined um, consensus on how we move forward with this in terms of integrated but in terms of uh, subject wise lectures uh, then we as microbiology teachers should be very very conscious in trying to get rid of redundant stuff we have to be brave enough to say that okay this is not required at the end of the day you think of the doctor is he going to make use of this is he going to require this because not everybody is going to be a md microbiology student if they do then they have to start from um, a scratch and then they have to read up a lot but we are not catering to the post graduates as now at this point of time with this particular cbme of course the see the curriculum for post graduates is completely different but for undergraduate we need to be very very specific and very bold i should say to say that you know these redundant stuff need not be taught it requires a lot of courage because we feel a little you know insecure oh god i have not taught them this i have not taught them that but then think back and see whether it is really required when you look at it from the patient care uh, care point of view or from a case based uh um this uh, you know education thank you i hope it was uh, useful
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reba. Uh, we will be starting our Q&A session in about five minutes. So I request uh, Dr. Shampa, Dr. Reba, Dr. Suchitra to be back on screen because, again, the spotlight is going to be on you with all the question and answers. Before that, uh, I would just like to say uh, thank all the attendees for the questions you have posted so far. Some of you have got answers uh, directly from Dr. Reba. But in case you do think of any other questions or you would like to leave comments or suggestions or would like to reach out to faculty as such, please feel free to do so in the email uh, which would have been provided uh, when you got your confirmation re for registration. In that, there is an email, Krishnantar.Punjan.OrientBlacks.com. Please feel free to address uh, us through that portal at any time. And uh, I would like to inform you that uh, the copies of Anitna and Panikur, the 11th edition textbook of microbiology, is available right now at uh, your local store, your uh, store which you have possibly used all these years to access copies. And uh, as uh, um, we would be very pleased to send you the competency mapping, which is not in the book, but we do have a competency mapping which tells you, gives you the list of competencies uh, along and matches it with the chapters and the pages where you would find the relevant information. As Dr. Reba said, there is a lot of back and forth to, to be done in this book, and I'm sure it will be for all of microbiology, teaching microbiology in the coming years. So we would be very happy to send you a competency mapping to all the attendees. We do have your email registration addresses, and please um, expect that. Now, um, we will move on to the Q&A session. Dr. Reba, you have been looking, and all the, Dr. Shampa and Dr. Suchitra, you have been looking at the various questions which have been yeah. posted by the attendees, and I note yes. that you have answered a fair few of them. If I could just broadly categorize, I think the first worry is these students are coming in raw. How do we load them with uh, knowledge when they don't have the base? The second set of questions is, a lot of it is about integration. How do we integrate uh, other subjects with microbiology? And the third part, I think some of them may have been students, is how are we going to assess them effectively? Uh, you know, so would you like to pick on a few questions which you think is uh, uh, very significant and take a sample of each and go ahead and answer those, Dr. Rama? Yeah, um, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll uh, answer the first question. How do we overload them with so much of information but remember now it, in fact the uh, the competency based curriculum has actually made it more concise earlier on we had 100 and uh, you know so 190 hours of uh, sorry 250 hours of teaching and uh, now it has been made uh, uh, concise and made less and the number of lectures didactic lectures is only 70 so we have to very consciously cut down like as i mentioned in my previous uh, uh, slides that we have to very consciously cut down on, uh, you know, um, po large portions of uh, the subject uh, matter, which we, which you think is not going to be of any use to the uh, undergraduate student. Like if you really go and talk, you know, I would request, I would suggest that all of you, uh, many of you can just call up for some of the PGs of the uh, of uh, some other uh, departments and find out, okay, how much of the microbiology that we taught you do you remember? Or is it useful? Not remember, is it useful? So when you ask them that question, you will come, you'll be surprised to know that most of them will say hardly anything, right? So when the student comes to us, he's absolutely raw. He has no idea about what is microbiology. It's like a clean slate. So in that clean slate, whatever we are going to write is going to remain. So they don't come with a preconceived idea that uh, microbiology, we have to learn 440 organisms, we have to learn about 550 media. No, what we teach them is what, uh, when they come, in, come to us and what we teach them is uh, going to be, uh, is going to be, um, uh, you know, the fresh for them. So we have to tune or we have to modulate our uh, um, teaching mater material and make it to fit that particular objective. And each of these curriculum comes with a specific objective. So we have to keep on going back to the objective and restricting or cutting down on or chopping out things which are, uh, which are extraneous, which are not required, and just make it uh, mandate, uh, you know, fit into that uh, particular objective. It takes a lot of courage, I can tell you that, because we have been trying that for the past one year. When we knew that the curriculum was coming in, we knew that we had to chop down. And then, believe me, you, we have been trying it 
and uh, like I, I, you know, many of my faculty say, "Oh, ma'am, we have to tell them this. Oh, ma'am, we have to tell them that." Then we very consciously took an effort. We said, "No, it is not required. It is not." So we have to bring out this teaching to what is actually absolutely necessary. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, I think leading on from that point, uh, in terms of integration, uh, Dr. Avinash Garagram has, it has represented uh, several of questions which have been asked. Madam, kindly enlight, uh, uh, highlight the importance of case studies in hypersensitivity, transplantation, etc. Is there any normal, normal method for framing the case or MCQs according to CBME for these topics? So he's traversing integration as well as assessment. Uh, in, it is not, it's not um, necessarily only in hypersensitivity across your topics, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Like as I mentioned earlier, also there are we now. Of course, most many of the books are coming out with case scenarios or case studies. Uh, similarly, even Anand Narayan has almost every chapter has a case. So that's what I said. You pick up those cases, and from there you build it. Even our immunology also, we have now included a certain some uh, cases, and um, you know how to uh, what are the case scenarios. Definitely autoimmune disorders and immunodeficiencies, uh, we can build up the cases. And I would suggest you look up uh, maybe Harrison's book of uh, infectious diseases or, uh, you know, some of these uh, medicine books and build up your cases on that. And I'm sure you, if you want, you can definitely build uh, uh, cases in immunology. In fact, in every aspect of uh, microbiology, it could be case uh, or uh, scenario uh, oriented. You know, even including hospital acquired infection, every time, everywhere, you can build in cases and case studies. Case studies are very important to bring home the point of what you're going to teach. So I would suggest that start your class, every class that you're going to take, start it with a case. You know, that will revert, revert the student's attention. He will, uh, you know, when you start with the case, okay, so today, um, uh, you know, there was a patient who came in with a 25-year-old male who came in with a um, uh, infections of the lungs or, uh, you know, like some opportunistic infections. So what do you think? What kind of, what aspect of uh, immune apparatus do you think is, uh, is involved? And from there you start off talking about the immunodeficiency dis uh, disorders or uh, similarly. So that is an important way or that's a very good way of catching the attention. Instead of straight away starting, okay, immunity means uh, de defining what is immunity, what is that? So the student will already start scratching his uh, shoes on the floor or looking at his mobile. And uh, so you will lose his attention. But if you start with a case, you know, you're sitting in the OPD, a patient walks in and you see that he's uh, got white patches in his mouth. So similar kind of a scenario. So that will revert them to what you're trying to say. So yes, most of the uh, chapters do have uh, case scenarios, but you are most welcome to pick up, to make up your own cases and include these cases in the formative assessments also. All right. Thank you so much. Now, if we could go on to something specific, because a lot of requests have come in for this. If you could expand, I, I think, Dr. Sustrasham, please explain integrated teaching of immunology and pathology. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, issues about how to actually integrate. It's fine to see it on paper, but how do you actually do it? So it, I'd be grateful if it's fine. See, uh, when we are talking about immunology, there is a lot of topic. I mean, we realized, you know, when uh, even before the CBME had come, we realized that there were a lot of topics which we were actually uh, repeating between pathology and microbiology. So, uh, one example, if we have to give you, uh, in case of hypersensitivity, we stopped teaching them in the lecture classes. We took up hypersensitivity as a problem based learning. We would just make up a case. And um, I mean, for example, we would say that there is a child which had a bite honeybee or a sting by a honeybee. And post that, the child was brought to the OPD and the child was having some symptoms. Or we could also, you know, this we had made different kinds of cases like this in each year. We have been doing this for last six, seven years. Uh, believe me. The students do perfectly good. And uh, even when we go and uh, assist them with long question or short notes, they're able to answer it. So uh, hypersensitivity was never taken as a lecture class or as a SGT in uh, microbiology. We would take it as a problem-based learning. So there would be around half an hour which the students are given a batch of 20. 
because uh, we are we were a private in, uh, university we were already doing this kind of small group teaching so every 20 students one one uh, faculty will be there because every day only 80 students we are a batch of 250 students but uh, every day only 80 students come to microbiology out of which they are again broken into four batches so one faculty for 20 students so the uh, case would be given to the student and the students used to analyze it so well and we tell them that you have to come with 20 objectives because each of you should get one objective to present now in case of cbme there is also something called as formative assessment and summative assessment we can consider this pbl as a formative assessment so when they come to present so in the first part whenever there is going to be a representing the brainstorming session as we call it we see the participation of each student and we give them marks similarly again after we give them a time after two uh, two weeks and tell them that they have to present their objectives of that particular thing but whatever objectives they come about the particular facilitator will see whether they are going in the right direction or not so that we can just push them towards it and see that they get the right objective and then the 20 objectives the students will be preparing all of them have to prepare for all the 20 objectives we pick chits in the class so that the student will not know otherwise they will come prepared we had this one uh, you know incident where the students prepared and they made a ppt and they came according to their roll number and they only spoke about their objective and walked off so they will not be studying the entire chapter so that's one reason why we say we pick your chits and we will say the roll number you will have to do this particular objective so they do not know which objective will come to them and we also insist that it should not be a ppt presentation because they will just make a roll and then they come and put it we say make use of the blackboard so that way or the whiteboard so that way we are forcing the student to learn the subject and come but they do really well so that's one kind of you know trying wherever there is going to be a topic which is taught in other subject where we can teach it here because it is a core competency we cannot say that we will not teach it and therefore that we can do whereas in case of transplantation and tumor immunology this enormous thing being thought uh, about these topics in pathology so what we have decided is we will put it as a self directed learning we tell the students these are the objectives in microbiology which you should be understanding and we refer them to a textbook but in the next sgt that is the small group teaching we have a formative assessment in which these topics will be considered so now you are ensuring that the student will read and come now all of these what we used to do previously was whatever was taken in the small group teaching as an assessment part that was included in their internal assessment and that was actually us because the first year we did it the students knew that they just have to come and sit and go we were taking the trouble of trying to do different kinds like tutorials and seminars and things so to force them to get involved we did this assessment and we also told them out of 15 marks 3 marks will come from these sgts the formative assessment so there was an involvement from the students so i think i hope i have answered uh, some of the doubts like how we have come about these small problems and we i mean we are still learning so these are few small things we've been doing in the last few years so this just i'm sharing with you thank you so much dr chitra very canny and cutting ways of keeping the student involved and on their toes uh, you know so in in uh, continuation with your comment it was one uh, in a small group discussion how will you manage 200 plus students and complete the whole course this angst obviously is from faculty who is this is a practical problem because you've got a large audience and you you're, you're supposed to do a small group discussion so how do you translate 200 plus to a small group discussion it is very very difficult many of the faculty will not be able to avail their leave at all for months believe me it is difficult because we have to manage the diagnostic some of us are involved in the infection control practices in the hospital and we do not have pgs coming into us from the last few years so it's very very difficult but if you having junior residents you can make use of them so what we have done is uh, or maybe it is very a compulsion for all of us now uh, they have divided the batch into three uh, three teams a b c so a comes to us on monday b on tuesday and c comes on wednesday i'm just giving you an example the rest two teams will go either to pathology or pharmacology now the 80 students who are with us they are with us in the whole afternoon 2 to 5 o'clock okay 2 to 3 we have an sgt so in the sgt we divide this 80 students again into 20 each so there are four faculty who are getting involved in the, in engaging this 20 students it is very very tedious after that one hour all the 80 come together again for practical session 
so then we are four of us who can manage the practical session but uh, you know uh, to have a uniformity the same four faculty will be involved in the entire week and we try to do it so that we have some kind of you know we, i want to take a leave i want so what i try to do is when we do the timetable is we try to see that the theory class we have two theory classes in that week and three uh, three days will be sgt and uh, practicals so we try to give those two theory hours for those four faculty members who are involved we have two batches because we are 250 we have a batch and b batch 125 125 so we try to give those four classes or uh, you know to the teaching faculty who are going to take the sgt and the sgt and practicals are related to the theory classes the timetable is set in such a way so that there is a relation which is happening like i gave an example of tuberculosis then the tuberculosis lectures are going on in the sgts we are talking about in one particular part we are taking about atypical mycobacteria another would be leprosy so now to make the students see everybody is talking about tuberculosis everybody is talking about mycobacteria they will be really you know fed up of listening to only mycobacteria so to involve the students we make it a student seminar so there are, you know 20 students are there we can divide equally about the atypical and leprosy lepro uh, you know mycobacterium leprae and leprosy is again thought for them in pathology so in detail so definitely it helps for them to read and then come so this is how we try to engage the students and also try to make our lives a little easy easier thank you so much dr sajita but shampa this is a question on assessment perhaps would be able to take it it says internal assessment or term exams should be in 50 marks or 100 that's the question only at the end of 11 months we can categorize as paper 1 and paper 2 exactly and how many assessment exams have to be conducted okay now mci has uh, uh, laid down that there should be three internal assessments during the entire 11 months so and the number marks have, uh, is left to the university to decide how much marks one has to uh, set for the internal assessment for the final it has given two theory papers 100 marks each but for the internal assessment the only thing is that the student should get 40% in theory and 40% in practical but overall the student should get 50% in order to be eligible to sit in the final exam so the earlier the internal assessment was included in the final exam but now The, the student is only eligible to sit in the final exam if he has secured 40% in theory 40% in practical but overall 50% but the total marks is up to the university how much marks one keeps it could be 100 marks out of 100 50 theory and 50 practical so 40 out of 50 i mean 20 out of 50 in theory and 20 out of 50 in practical but overall 50 out of 100 or whatever that is up to the college or institute or whatever to decide marks are not given only the percentage is given that it should be this way and uh, final of course everything has been laid down thank you thank you so much uh, this leads on to another couple of questions uh, which are related uh, one is from uh, dr kunal lehri how do we conduct the practical exams should it be case based as we will be teaching them uh, you know case based approach and there was another question when i scrolled which said uh, how do you standardize uh, the exams across the country Uh, or is it left to the universities to devise a plan uh, for themselves so which of you would like to take this i think uh, now the ospi is coming up in a big way so ospi stations where it is absolutely standardized you for a gram stain for uh, acid fast stain we have marks if suppose it's a 10 mark question on a gram stain we divide that gram stain 10 marks into again subheadings like how the smear has been prepared and whether the the staining whether it is over decolorized under decolorized so that way we give marks if it is a, uh, if it is a one mark two marks is the for the staining then minus one if it is under decolorized or minus one if it is over decolorized and that way we divide the preparation of the smear then the staining then if the student is showing it in a high par or in the oil and with the finally he is cleaning the slide and he is disposing the slide so everything can be all the components even waste disposal i mean that part is also can be integrated in that 10 minute exercise of the ospi so that is a very standardized way of doing so we can make these ospi for all the exercises and uh, that could be uniformly if we circulate that this is how we have done uh, again of course it is uh, the examiners who decide 
how much mark has to be given and uh, how do we uh, split that mark but uh, this is of course very standardized way of doing but i don't think we can ask we can give case then we give a case of course we can give a case we give a case history and after that we ask the uh, he has how he goes about diagnosing like uh, the entire case is uh, the case history is given and then uh, it could be urinary tract infection so midstream urine the urine has been cultured and then the plate is given and finally you ask questions on uh, uh, identification of the pathogens uh, causing urinary tract infection so that way i think but i think dr reba is very ready to uh, elaborate more <laughs> so please, you please, please continue please, please. <laughs> yeah i was ab- i was about to barge in shampa thanks for thanks for uh, assessing my <laughs> enthusiasm to answer this question um yeah we actually in uh, pondicherry we have been uh, uh, you know conducting the in the practicals we have been conducting one exercise called uh, problem solving exercise or problem based exercise that is entirely case based and we have problem uh, based exercise both for uh, uh, systematic bacteria uh, um, systemic infections like uh, uh, you know bacteriology then we also have for virology and uh, uh, then uh, we have for immunology so what we do is like as uh, shampa uh, dr shampa mentioned we have a particular case you know give a case with uh, several uh, uh, offshoots of questions on that and we along alongside that we keep a particular let's say an elisa test if it's a case of an hiv we keep an elisa or um, uh, an opportunistic infection we focus under the microscope uh, some uh, let's say strongyloides and then based on that particular question we ask uh, you know what do you think this is what, what is the uh, thing and uh, focus and uh, see the uh, see the microscopic finding and give your uh, report so that's how we do and uh, we have um, um, uh, almost uh, it's a fifth exercise like we have a gram stain we have a, a special like asafas stain and then we have a stool examination and the fourth exercise is actually the problem solving exercise and that is a must the pondicherry university has actually included that and so we uh, have that uh, as a part of practical assessment so in the co- competency based uh, uh, curriculum this is going to be very useful uh, because we are already teaching them the competencies at the case based uh, studies or syndromic approach and having these uh, problem based um, questions for practicals is going to be, it is just an it, uh, it is a kind of assessing their analytical skills and their interpretative skills so like for example if we have a, a particular uh, let's say vidal test in an enteric fever we ask them uh, what is the titer can you tell us what the titer is is it significant if it is not what what are the interpretations that you can have what is your inference give a report so that is how we uh, assess the uh, uh, problem based exercises and i think it it has helped us a lot in in kind of training the undergraduates and they become a little more it's it's a very very clinically oriented exercise thank you all right now there's one more question where we have to go back to the basics uh it's by dr uh, uh, sent in by dr archana wankade all organisms are totally new for students when after general and immunology we are going to start them off with system system wise then it will be completely bombarding them with various causative agents for that particular infection this is the bug bear for when you are starting to teach. how can we make it easy and simplify the whole process to make the students understand because at this phase when they come in they will not be aware about the various kinds of organs this is no. the, uh, the the yeah. big question the catch 22 yeah. of the talk when you teach can so, i answer that question please do ma'am please do yes <laughs> yeah what i basically feel is and what i would advocate and what is what we are planning i mean what has to be done is that initially when we start uh, okay we finish the general microbiology and immunology and we are planning to start the systematic or the syndromic approach to infectious diseases before we start there should be an overview of what is an infection what are the uh, uh, microorganisms involved in an in, um, in an infection so there would be definitely an overview of bacteria bacteria virus fungi and parasites an overview what are these organisms what do they do where do they live how do they survive and what is their classification how are they classified based on what type of classification so just a small brief introduction to every aspect of every uh, you know group of the microorganisms first has to be taught to them 
and then we uh, say that okay how, once you know about this how do we diagnose these kind of infections in general so we need to have a specimen we need to have a, a, you know uh, isolate them we need to culture them or we need to do an antibody detection uh, or we need to do a microscopic examination so that will give them a, a a feel of what they are going to go into next then we move on to the systems so when we come to the systems like as dr shampa has mentioned in cns infection you will have uh, the bacteria causing meningitis you have viruses causing encephalitis you have uh, parasites causing um, encephalopathies so when they read about that then they have already discussed what are these parasites what are these bacteria what are these virus so they will be able to correlate and after teaching them that particular syndrome or the system or the infection then we go on to teach what are the major what are the uh, the major organisms involved in that let's say bacteria you have a um, uh, uh, you know streptococcus pneumoniae or haemophilus causing pyogenic meningitis so when you are teaching them pyogenic meningitis you tell them about streptococcus pneumoniae and uh, then you tell them about uh, haemophilus then when you are talking about encephalitis you take, uh, tell them about uh, herpes or uh, uh, um, or uh, any other virus which causes encephalitis so similarly and after you teach them then you have to direct them to go back to that particular chapter on streptococcus pneumonia you don't have to you know go in great details and teach them you say that you know this is uh, and that can be a self directed learning you tell them this is chapter uh, so and so has uh, discusses streptococcus pneumonia where you will read about the organism and you will also know what are the other infections that are caused and maybe as a directive or as a guide uh, to them you can pick out these organisms and and direct them to the various important aspects of that organism and um, uh, you know so that there is uh, you uh, you teach them uh, you know the disease and the basics of the disease and the organism but don't go too much into the organism as such to say that uh, you know every detail uh, part of the organism so you because you remember you have to teach so many organisms now if you start teaching streptococcus pneumonia as one particular class then there will be no end to it oh, so you have you. to cut down thank you thank you so much uh, 30 seconds for dr suchitra and dr shampa 30 seconds because we are really running out of time anything any words of encouragement for your co faculty members out there who are going to tackle this academic uh, year it's only that we are going to learn from each other please okay. share your experiences we share our experiences and we learn and grow together Exactly, I agree with Dr. Suchitra very well said. That okay. I, as I have told, I had mentioned that we are none of us is really uh, expert in this new uh, oh, uh, teaching. So let us all join hands together and march forward. Or uh, thank plunge. you, at University of Press. Uh, we uh, would uh, encourage you to send us your feedback. Uh, at, as I told you, the portal earlier in your uh, emails. and you know please send us feedback because we value feedback uh, immensely and we can publish better and do better only with your feedback uh, now i invite uh, my colleague malini to please uh, give the vote of thanks thank you dr sudha a very good evening to our respected panelists valued attendees and my dear colleagues i malini gopalakrishnan assistant editor university press and privileged to conclude today's session On behalf of University Press, I would like to extend my gratitude to our esteemed panelists, Dr. Riba Kanungo, Dr. Shampa Anupurva, and Dr. Suchitra Shinoy, for taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules to come together to discuss this pertinent issue. Thank you, panelists, for your time and your expert insights and guidance. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the members of the audience who made time today to attend this session. We sincerely hope that you all found this webinar informative and interesting, and that it answered some of the questions you might have had on transitioning from the traditional approach to the teaching of microbiology to the new system-based one prescribed in the CBME curriculum. To the management team and my colleagues at University Press and Orion Black Swan, who worked tirelessly to bring this event together, a big thank you. Once again, a very good evening to all of you. Good evening, everyone.